The scriptures of this weekend are so filled with uh, important points that the first part of my homily this morning, I'm going to do a little bit of Bible studying. study. I always hate that the homily is supposed to be more than just Bible study. But there are five points, at least in today's scripture, that I want to briefly hit on. And if you want to talk more about it, let me know. The first in the, in the Genesis is Genesis chapter 3, the Garden of Eden, the tree. Just so you notice, there is never, it never mentions an apple. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's only later with art and photography and so on that the tree becomes an apple tree. And also notice that the man and woman do not have any names. They're merely called a man and his offspring. It was only later that we took the Hebrew name for man, Adam, and the, woman, the mother of the living is Eve to, to represent two people. It was not that way because it represents all of us, not just two people. Secondly, in the story, the serpent is not Satan. The serpent is not Satan. That application of, of uh, the serpent to Satan came centuries later. In the story, the serpent represents the power of temptation. The power of temptation. Because we're given a human nature and we have free will, I would guess that every one of us has, been, has experienced the power of temptation the power of selfishness. That's what this is all about. It's right, like I said, this, we're in the garden. The story is about us. Third, the end of the story represents that humanity will eventually win. If you ever think about all of the evil in the world or whatever, you always wonder how it's going to work out because of the last verse. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will strike at your head. You will strike at his heel. Now that's a very confusing verse. But scripture scholars tell us that means that even after the humankind sinned and turned away from God, God promised that, that the goodness will eventually win out. Evil will never win out in the, in the end because of Christ. That's what that verse hints to. Number four, the unforgivable sin. I don't know if you ever talked about that or so often people will wonder, what is the unforgivable sin? And so many people think that inadvertently they might have committed the unforgivable sin and because of that, even unknowingly, they're damned to hell for all eternity. The, uh, all uh, three gospel writers talk about the unforgivable sin and each has a little different twist. But fundamentally, the unforgivable sin is if somebody believes that God cannot forgive their sin. Someone believes that God cannot forgive their sin because if someone believes that God cannot forgive their sin, hello, their sin isn't forgiven. But that is not unforgivable. If that person would change their mind and accept God's forgiveness, then it's there. Number five, the gospel talks about Jesus' brothers and sisters. That makes all of us Catholics nervous because our faith says that Mary was a perpetual virgin. She had no other children. So we explain that to mean either the broader sense of brothers and sisters, like our cousins and relatives and friends, labor unions and fraternities and sororities call each other brother and sister. Or some say Joseph had a previous marriage and his wife died before he married Mary and he brought to the marriage children from his first marriage. That's the five points of Bible study. Now, let's enter the garden because as I've said now three times, we're in the garden. And we are, we are exposed to the power of temptation. 
And again, I think because we're all human, I'm certainly exposed to it, we have all given in to temptation. And whenever we sin, what do we try to do? We hide or we try to cover it up or we try to blame somebody else. That's what the story is about. Stories told of a little boy that went into his mother's purse and stole some money, went to the store, bought some candy and ate it, and he felt so guilty that he went home and hid in the closet. Finally, his mother found him and she knew immediately, what did you do wrong? We're, aren't we the same way? If you've any, ever committed any big sin especially, don't you want to hide? Don't you want nobody to know? That's what the story is about. That's us. Or we blame somebody else. If you have children and one children breaks the lamp, they'll always blame it on their brother or sister and so on. And we do that as adults. Uh, in our society especially, we're so exposed to victimhood that if something happens to me, it's always somebody else's fault. We never take responsibility. The story's about us. So it's into that garden, remember we're in it now, that God becomes present in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. That's the gospel. And his thinking is so different than our thinking that the response of the people around him is, first of all, he's the devil. Because the people in the gospel don't want to, the religious leaders especially, don't want to be challenged. Or they don't want to accept what he has to say. So they put the blame on him. We do the same thing. If somebody doesn't agree with us, it's their fault. Or if you get into an argument with somebody, uh, you'll, you'll start picking on their personality traits. You read it all the time in the newspaper, especially with our politicians. They don't debate the issues, they debate personalities. We look for the devil in somebody else. And then the family comes to Jesus and they want him to come back home. Why? Because they think he's out of his mind. They think he's crazy. His ideas were so different than the ideas of the people around him that they said, this guy's got to be crazy. And if you and we, if we honestly think about all that Jesus asks of us, our conclusion will be either he's a devil, therefore wrong, or he's crazy. Because we don't want to be challenged. We have made up our mind. That's part of human nature. Every one of us, we want what we want when we want it, and we want it now. We want it our way. Jesus came and tried to give us the perspective of God's ways. You know it as well as I. Think about Jesus' what Jesus revealed God's ways to us. Think about what he, how he revealed about forgiveness or compassion or mercy, or a greater concern for others than ourselves. If you think about that seriously, it's usually not what we want to do or we want to hear. So we either say, he's the devil or he's crazy. When I, when I think about the challenge of Jesus in my life, I try to make excuses. I try to rationalize. I say, well, Jesus never lived in the 21st century. He never realized what all the things that I have to deal with. So therefore, he doesn't know. Or perhaps he just is unconcerned. But he does know. And he challenges us to accept the ways of God, even if we think it's unbelievable unlivable, unmanageable, because we're called as disciples not to do it our way, but to do it his way, the ways of God.